Our goal here today is for us to be able to empower everybody here so that hopefully when you leave here, you're going to be able to do something different tomorrow that maybe you were doing yesterday that can hopefully put you in better health in the future. That's our goal today. We call this program End Your Weight. And we call it that for a few reasons. The first is this important word, end. We want this to feel like a call to action for folks. There's something, in other words, that you can do when you leave here to be able to make you healthier. So that's the end. Do something to get to the end. And then this word, wait. Nobody likes waiting. Nobody likes waiting for insignificant things, right? We don't like to be put on hold. We don't like to wait in traffic. We don't like to wait in that long airport line. We don't like to wait for anything. I hate waiting. But now we're talking about waiting to try to be healthy again. Imagine a situation where you're not well and someone says, well, we can make you well, but you have to wait. And so we understand that that's a struggle. And so the goal of this program is to really focus on helping you to find strategies to end your weight to return to good health. Okay, so, so I'm Dr. Bingaman. I'm a transplant surgeon here um, at Methodist Specialty and Transplant Hospital. And, and we've got a great number of folks uh, here from our team. I'm looking out and I see familiar faces uh, of some of our great team members. Um, and we'll have time for personal introductions later, but we've got uh, some nephrologists here. I see Dr. Diaz Wong and Dr. Kapercheck here. Uh, we've got nurses uh, here. I see Jessica and there are probably Amanda's here and some other nurses that we can meet later. We have, have some uh, nursing uh, assistants or transplant assistants here. Uh, Chris is here and I see Tammy. And we've got uh, Laurel here, uh, who specializes in nutrition and uh, transplant uh, uh, dietitian. And, and then I, in, in particular, want to thank uh, Hannah uh, in, in the back um, for organizing uh, this event. Uh, she's done a tremendous job. And so I want to thank Hannah. Uh, and I want to introduce Donna, who's helped Hannah uh, as well. So, so some quick introductions of our team. Uh, that's come out and is also as equally passionate uh, as I am and our whole program is uh, about this event today. So what are we going to talk about? So we're going to talk about the advantages of live donor kidney transplant, and we're going to talk about some strategies uh, to hopefully allow you to make this happen for you. We're going to talk about what does it mean to donate a kidney. We're going to have some questions and answers, take a short break, and then we're going to talk about some success stories. Folks that have been in this chair and gone on to have a live donor transplant. And we're even going to talk to donors as well so that they can share their stories. And I can tell you, this isn't the first End the Weight program we've had here. I'm pleased to say that we've had success stories just from this program. People have received transplants at this hospital after they were in your chair and they were able to go home and utilize the strategies they learned and are now off dialysis as a result. So we're gonna to talk to some folks that have gone through this and have some more questions and answers. I like to say the program begins today because this is a process, right? So, so the program begins today with education, right? Because we've got to learn about what it takes to be able to find a living donor which is what we're gonna talk about today. But education without action doesn't really get you anywhere, right? We're judged not so much on what we know, but really what we do, right? So education today, and then when you leave here, action. And then that leads to a transplant and a healthier life. Why are we here? Last year in the United States, 4,628 people died on the waiting list. These are actually some of our best patients. 
because these are folks that actually qualified to get on the list. These are folks that their kidney doctor said, I think these folks could benefit from a transplant. They came to the transplant center. Transplant center thought they were a good candidate for the list. Mailed them a letter, said, congratulations, you're on the list. And last year, 4,628 of those folks died waiting. Another 4,747 people got a letter that said, I'm sorry, you're no longer healthy enough to be on the list. We've taken your name off. Because they became too sick. In the United States, over 9,000 people every year are taken off the list because they became too sick or they died while waiting. So we've got to do something to end this Wait. The burden of kidney disease in the United States is remarkable. If you have kidney disease, you're not alone. There's 26 million people in the United States with kidney disease. Almost a half a million people in the United States are on dialysis. Over 55,000 people here in Texas alone are on dialysis, so you're not alone. Kidney disease is the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. More folks die from kidney disease than die from breast cancer or prostate cancer. Kidney disease discriminates. It's three times more common in African Americans, and it's one and a half times more common in Hispanics. And the cost of kidney disease is remarkable. It's in the billions of dollars. But what about the cost to society, which is really what we're most interested in, right? How does it, what's the cost to your lifestyle? It's hard to work on dialysis. It's hard to raise a family on dialysis. It's hard to feel well on dialysis, even on the days when you ain't on dialysis. It's hard to function normally when you're on dialysis, and so the cost and burden to society is great. So what are the options? Well, there are a lot of options now, right? You can be on dialysis in the center, which accounts for most folks in the United States. Some folks are on home hemodialysis, and some folks are on home peritoneal dialysis. And then, of course, we've got options for transplant, both from a living donor and a deceased donor. And we've known over decades, since the first kidney transplant was done in the United States successfully back in 1954, we've known for decades that by far the optimal therapy for patients with kidney disease is a transplant. Folks that receive transplants live longer and live better than folks on dialysis. The average person that receives a kidney transplant lives about 10 years longer than the average person who qualified for a transplant but didn't get one. Remarkable benefits to transplant. And I'm pleased to say now there are over 180,000 people in the United States living healthy lives with a kidney transplant, which is really, truly remarkable. So I like to think of dialysis as a bridge. I don't like to think of dialysis as the end. Right? I like to think of dialysis as a bridge to transplant. Dialysis keeps you well until you're able to one day get a transplant. And ideally, everybody would cross that bridge. Ideally, everybody would get a transplant. But it isn't so, as we talked about earlier. And it's because there's too many people waiting. And that list has been growing. In other words, there's too much kidney disease, and there aren't enough kidneys to go around. And this slide says it best. In the United States now, today, there are 96,791 people waiting on the list for a kidney transplant. And yet last year, there were only 13,430 kidneys to go around for those folks on the list. 13,430 kidneys for 96,000 people on the list. And every year, this issue gets worse. Last year, 
there were 35,400 folks added to the waiting list. 35,000 people added to the waiting list and 13,000 kidneys available is a deficit. And it's that deficit that we have to deal with every day, which leads to folks waiting on the list. There aren't enough kidneys to go around. And so I tell folks when they come to see us, the most important question during the interview process is this, right? Do you have anybody that can donate a kidney to you? Because if you have somebody that can donate, then you don't have to fool with the list. No waiting time. And in general, kidneys from living donors work better and last longer than kidneys from deceased donors. The average kidney from a deceased donor these days might last eight to 12 years, whereas the average kidney from a living donor might last more than 15 years. Dramatic improvement in survival after live donor transplant compared to deceased donor transplant. The truth is, if you have a motivated and healthy living kidney donor, you could receive a transplant and be off dialysis in as little as two or three months. I mean, think about that. This is August. If we put into action what we learned today and have somebody call us and start this process and are motivated and healthy, maybe somebody in here is off dialysis for the holidays. And I'm hopeful we can make that happen for you because the holidays are a particularly difficult time to be on dialysis. If you have a living donor, you could maybe be off dialysis in as little as two to three months. Well, of course, when we ask this question, do you have anyone that can donate a kidney? A more common response is this, I don't have a donor. Because there are challenges. It's not so simple to find somebody that wants to donate a kidney. And we recognize that. There are challenges. So what are those challenges? Well, these are some of them, right? So folks don't know enough about live donation. In other words, if you're on dialysis, you're not an expert in live donation, so you're not sure really what to say. You're hesitant to ask. One of the more common things I hear is, I'm the healthiest person in my family. So I don't have anybody in my family that can donate. And so we've got folks that say, I don't have anyone at home. The truth of the matter is more than 50% of living kidney donors in the United States aren't family members. But they don't know who else to ask. Or they don't know how to start the conversation. These are challenges and they're real challenges. But we have to overcome challenges. And that's part of the business that we're in, is overcoming challenges. So how do we meet this challenge? Well, my advice in how to overcome any challenge in life is to identify a partner, right? You have to have a team because nobody can really achieve anything, in my view, alone. It's just too difficult. So the first thing to do is to identify an advocate. This isn't something that you can navigate through best alone. Some folks feel like, well, you know, I don't want to fool with burdening anybody with my situation. Okay. That needs to be rethought. Because everything that's difficult in life, in my view, needs a partner to solve that. So you need a team. It could be a family member that isn't healthy that can't donate, but wants to help you in this challenge. It could be a friend, someone with good people skills, right? In other words, we're gonna be talking about in a minute the idea that you need to find a partner to help you get off dialysis, and so we're gonna to have to start thinking about someone that might help to spread the word, someone with good people skills, someone connected to a social network. In other words, if somebody's on dialysis, it's not so simple to go out and mingle or go out and work 
or be active in social environments. And so find a team member, find a partner that feels well and can help you in this endeavor. Think about your social networks. I tell people nobody can offer to donate a kidney to you unless they know you need one. So you have to get the word out. Amongst who? There are a wealth of options. Family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, faith group members, other groups you or your advocate may belong to. And then there's other ways to get the word out through media, newspapers, flyers, church bulletins, posting something on somebody's work website or intranet. You're not working again. This is where you get your partner involved, right? So these are some of the social networks that are key to utilize that are going to lead you to be able to find somebody that could possibly donate a kidney to you. How do you start? So we recommend that you start with your story. People want to hear your story. People that are well, that are going about their lives, don't understand the burden of kidney disease that we just talked about at the beginning of this visit. Start with your story. How has kidney disease affected you? How has it affected your family? What does it mean to donate a kidney to somebody, which we're going to talk about? Don't expect people to agree right away, of course. And if people can't donate or aren't well enough to donate, put them on your team and say, maybe you can help me be on my team to find me a potential kidney donor. We recommend folks write their story and be honest and direct and use details. Some of the things I've talked about. Use your contact information and then the contact information for the transplant center. So if somebody is touched by your story and wants to learn more, they have a mechanism to do that. They're able to get on the internet, go to a website, and learn. Maybe they go home and they're thinking about it, or they talk to their spouse or family member about it, and they're thinking about it, that they just found out somebody is in need. And what would it take for them to donate a kidney? They have to have that contact information, a website to go on, so that they can learn more about it and take that next step. Let me show you an example. This is how somebody might write a story. Nearly 100,000 people in the United States are waiting for a kidney transplant. Most folks don't know that. And so you're educating them. <coughs> Our brother, sister, father has kidney failure and needs a kidney transplant to get off dialysis and live a longer and healthier life. Folks cannot offer to give you a kidney if they don't know you or your loved one needs one. The waiting time to receive a transplant off the list is usually over five years. Folks don't know that. Of the about 96,000 people in the United States waiting, about 16,000 of them have been waiting more than five years. And most folks here in South Texas are waiting more than five years. We're reaching out to our community to explore opportunities for living kidney donation. Be direct. Living kidney donors are usually healthy people between the ages of six, 18 and 65 who are free from kidney disease and we're doing some education here. We're telling folks who typically might qualify. And then we're ending, if you want more information or you want to think about how you can help others, here's the website learn more. This is a typical type of a scenario that we urge people to, when you leave here, write your story, share your story. Well, people are doing this. They're doing it every day. I told you more than 50% of living kidney donors in the United States aren't family members. 
So who are these people? They're folks that are touched by hearing a story like this. For example, help Brad find a kidney on Facebook. People are utilizing these social networks to get the word out. 910 likes, but it only takes one person, only takes one out of those 910 to come forward to say, I want to donate a kidney, pass the testing, and get Brad off dialysis. And he was able to get off dialysis as a result of getting the word out in an example like this. This comes across as funny on first blush, but the truth of the matter is, this guy wants his wife off dialysis. <clears throat> and he probably didn't qualify to donate, which is why he's walking the streets with a sign. The wife's probably not well enough to. And so she has a partner. She has a team member that's working for her to get the word out about kidney donation. I want to emphasize again, what I've said isn't easy. People say, well, I don't feel like I have the right to ask. I'm not comfortable doing that. What right do I have to ask folks to donate a kidney to me? I'll just continue to be on dialysis. But you have the knowledge. You or your loved one needs help. And what you're really doing isn't asking people, hey, can you give me your kidney? What you're doing is you're creating awareness of the need. People say, well, I don't want to be pushy. No, you don't want to be pushy, but you're not being pushy by simply creating awareness. You're not demanding anything. You're not asking people, tell me right now, if you're willing to do it. You're simply creating awareness. And by creating awareness, you're not being pushy. Your goal is to be able to let folks know what the need is, how kidney disease has affected your life, and trying to spread the word to see if anybody out there may be willing to learn more about what it takes to donate a kidney and go forward with the process. Tips for success. Okay, so we talked about these, and these are in your handout. Tell the story, be honest, Use your education materials and practice, right? Because this isn't a simple process, but you've got to get started with it. I say the key to success, try again, right? Try, try again, right? First you don't succeed, try, try again, right? Not if at first you don't succeed, then forget about it, right? Right? The key to success, double your failure rate. Keep trying. People come to see me and they say, well, I got the word out and nobody came forward. A couple people said they were interested, but then I never really heard back. Okay, well, when was that? Two years ago. Try again. Get a partner. Get a different partner. Get more partners, right? Get a bigger team, okay? What I'm trying to tell you is that the key to success is to keep trying. This program is about a call to action. Act. Action changes things. Education and learning only sets you up for action. Action changes things. This is about a call to action. Identify your advocate. Identify your social networks. Write your story. And get started. Tell 10 people, tell 50 people, tell 100 people. I tell folks, if you tell 100 people and 99 say no and one says yes and passes the testing, you're off dialysis. It just takes one. Keep a monthly log. How are you doing? And keep trying. And contact us with progress and questions because we're here to help. 
So if you get home and you start this process and you think of something, we're here to help. Call the donor hotline, call Jessica, call Chris, call me, call Dr. K. We're here to help you. This is a process and that process starts today. Now, I would ordinarily move to questions now, but I'm not gonna to move to questions now. I'm gonna spend another 10 minutes and talk about what it takes to donate a kidney because we have to have that information as well, right? In other words, what am I asking somebody to do? So let's talk about that for a minute. What does it take to donate a kidney? And so these are some basics, right? You have to be an adult, of course, and you've gotta be medically healthy and psychologically healthy, right? So in other words, if you have diabetes, you can't donate a kidney. If you've had a cancer or you have kidney disease, right? In other words, you've gotta be healthy, in other words, to be able to donate a kidney to somebody else, right? So if you're at risk of developing kidney disease yourself, then it's not safe for you to donate a kidney to somebody else. You can be on the team, but you can't donate yourself. You need to be a healthy person. What does it take? What it takes is first, having a potential donor go online, register and learn and get educated. That's the first step. Go online, learn, get educated and register to donate. And then what? Well, if you pass the health screening questionnaire, one of our team members gives a call to the potential donor and has a chat. And if the donor, potential donor sounds healthy, we ship blood tubes to their home locally, wherever they live. And they can go to a local blood drawing facility and have match testing done. That can be done at home. It takes about a week. They're called with those results. And if they still want to pursue the process, then they get some blood and urine testing done also locally at home to get the process started. And when those results come back, if they continue to look like the donor's healthy and continues to want to move forward with the process, we ask folks to come to San Antonio and meet our team and they visit with everybody and they have some testing done to again prove that the donor's healthy enough to move forward. And typically this process takes two to three months. And then all of the information is reviewed and if the donor's approved, we move forward to surgery. That's the essential process. And we can talk about that more in detail during the question session. The operation itself, typically one and a half to two hours to donate a kidney, the incision these days is about this big, just big enough to get the kidney out. So it's really a remarkable operation now to take the kidney out. And believe it or not, the majority of folks that donate a kidney go home the next day. Four to six weeks in general for a full recovery. Some donors go back to work in as little as two weeks, although we tell donors to plan to take three to six weeks off from work. Temporary pain medicines, no dietary restrictions. There are risks to donating a kidney. I'm not here to tell you that there's no risks to donating a kidney. There are risks. The risks are small, and that's part of the education process. You could die from donating a kidney, about three in 10,000 chance, about the risk of dying in childbirth. It's a small risk, but it's not zero. So this is a serious business. There are some very small long-term risks, slightly increased risk of high blood pressure, slightly increased risk of developing kidney disease yourself if you're a donor. Those risks are very small, but they're not zero. Folks that, donating a kidney, that donate a kidney live just as long, of course, as folks that don't. And you're probably not surprised to find out that donors live longer than the average person well, sure, because the person that donated a kidney was perfectly healthy, right? And the average American doesn't qualify to donate a kidney. You've got to be perfectly healthy. But folks that donate kidneys live just as long as if they didn't. The costs of kidney donation, of course, are covered by the recipient's insurance. And we can certainly talk about this if anybody has questions. But folks ask about that. Folks wonder about that. Donors don't even have to have their own insurance to donate because the costs are all related to the recipient insurance. 
There are a lot of myths about kidney transplantation. Boy, I hear lots of myths. I mean, people go into the grocery store and start talking about kidney transplant. I don't know. People tell me, oh, I went to the store, I ran into somebody, they told me something about kidney transplant. I think they did? They told you what? So there's a lot of myths. For example, a kidney donor has to take medicines for the rest of their life. Not true. Kidney donors are going to be in terrible pain for a long time. Not true. Kidney donors have to be on bed rest. Not true. Kidney donors are going to be in the hospital for a long time. Not true. Kidney donors can't be participating in sports. Not true. Kidney donors have to have a special diet. Not true. Kidney donors can't consume alcohol. Not true. Female donors can't get pregnant. Not true. A donor's sex life will be negatively affected. Not true. These are people, these are things people are worried about. They should be worried about them. They're not true. They're not true. We don't expect people to be experts on any of this, but that's what our transplant team is here for. <clears throat> Let me end with this. Virgil, who is a poet back in Roman times, before the birth of Christ, said, the greatest wealth is your health. The greatest health is your wealth. Wealth and health are tied. We've known this before Roman times, because without our health, <coughs> what do we have? So that's our passion here. Our passion here at this transplant hospital, where transplant is in the name of the hospital, is to get folks healthy again. But passion gets you so far, right? Passion has to be turned into action, which I've mentioned before. Our passion, your action. You know, we're a small hospital here. In San Antonio, Texas, a relatively small city in the United States. And in spite of that, our passion turned into action has allowed us to become the biggest live donor kidney transplant program in the entire United States. Last year, over 200 live donor transplants were done at this hospital, more than any hospital has ever done in the history of the United States, right here in this hospital. But not just last year. Since 2009, these are the biggest live donor transplant programs in the United States. And they're at pretty fancy hospitals. Northwestern in Chicago, the Mayo Clinic. San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, fancy medical centers across the country. But by far the biggest <laughs> is at this small hospital here in San Antonio. We've been able to turn our passion for what we do into action to make more people healthy. That's our goal. That's what we do. So that's what we're about. What I'd like to do now is to have a discussion and answer the questions that you've got about some of the things I just discussed. Um, I want to invite some team members up um, because, again, what we've been able to do is also as a result of our great team. Uh, Dr. Kapracek, maybe many of you know, uh, he's the medical director of the transplant program and a transplant nephrologist. Uh, Dr. Diaz Wong uh, is here. Uh, Jessica is here. Laurel, stand up, uh, is a nutritionist dietitian. Um, there's many questions about that. So what I'd like to do is open it up to questions now, and then we're going to take about a 10-minute break after the questions. We can mingle and ask further questions. Um, but let's open it up to any questions folks may have now. So, so the question is, so the question is, is, is somebody allowed to donate in exchange for something? And that's an excellent question that comes up. And the answer is no. It is against the law in the United States to donate a kidney in exchange for anything valuable. That's against the law. So it's very important 
that folks have to recognize if you're donating a kidney, you're donating it from your heart. What you get in exchange for donating a kidney is making somebody well. I would argue that's worth more than anything, quite frankly. But you're not able to get anything material in exchange for donating. Thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, the question is what, what's the age limit, age limit for donation? Now, the, uh, the statistics of health are such that, and this is what Dr. Bingaman showed during the presentation, of course, uh, uh, there is a lower limit. It's somebody who has to be legally be able to, uh, to consent to surgery and have enough understanding and maturity. So that's uh, the age of 18. And north of that, uh, it's 65. So it's a general guideline. Now, having had, said so, there are so many people in their 70s, for example, that are healthy enough to still donate. And this is what Dr. Bingaman was also saying. If you have somebody who appears to be healthy, they give them the information about the donor center. And the whole idea about the donor evaluation is not so much the agreement of somebody to donate, but they seek information about this. So yes, we have had donors that were over 70 that were healthy enough and donated and did very well. Okay, now another thing is that as we all get older, the kidney function sort of gets lower and lower with time. And also people have a, a higher likelihood of having other conditions, let's say uh, uh, calcifications of the arteries and other things. So they are less likely uh, also to qualify when they get evaluated. But we invite everybody to, the first step is to, this is why we have the donor evaluation, and I tell all the donors or people who ask me is, because uh, people are afraid that when they go on the website or they sign up that they actually already agree to it. That's not true. The whole purpose of the living donor evaluation is to give people information and and teach them about that. We do not assume that somebody who calls that, that uh, they will automatically become a donor because this is sometimes a fear of folks. Well, they're not going to even check it out because what if, what if they change their mind? There is a whole process. This is why we have a separate di division department that deals just with the donors so nobody can be uh, unduly influenced by family or, or, or other, uh, other pressures. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, is there an age limit for the recipient? I think 70. Is there an age limit for the recipient? Yeah. So the recipient age is like anything I would suggest that's a risk factor. Okay. So for example, we transplanted not too long ago a 78 year old, but he was otherwise reasonably healthy. Right, because we all know that age is just one factor that contributes to health. So there are folks into their 70s that are more healthy than folks that might be in their 40s and 50s. So having said that, the key is that a potential recipient's overall health suggests that they're going to benefit from a transplant and benefit for a long time, benefit for five to 10 years or longer. But if you're into your 70s, the truth of the matter is really your only chance at getting a transplant is probably with a living donor because to stay healthy on dialysis for five years, if you start on the list when you're 70, becomes very, very difficult, nearly impossible. And so actually it's one of the things we stress when you're a little bit older is the key is trying to see if you can't find someone that can donate a kidney to you and yes, even into your 70s, you can qualify, especially for a living donor transplant. Yes, ma'am. Are there any steps that are taken in order to uh, make a success rate higher for a person with a high PRA? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. So the question is, what if you have a lot of antibodies in your blood and it's hard for you to find a match? Is there anything I can do? That's the question. Okay. So let's talk for a minute about matching. So, we, so I encouraged you to see if you couldn't find somebody to donate a kidney to you. And so I would ask you, what are the chances of the person sitting next to you, if they're not related, and neither one of you knows your blood types, if you've never had a transfusion or a previous transplant, what are the chances of you all being a match? What's the chance of you being a match to the, with the person next to you? 
Well, based on blood type, there's about a two out of three chance that the person sitting next to you is a match. A two out of three chance. That's a pretty good chance. Sometimes people say, oh, I can't believe I was a match. We're not even related. <laughs> well, it doesn't work that way. There's a two in three chance, <clears throat> statistically, that you're gonna be a match with the person sitting next to you if neither one of you know your blood types, okay? Now, matching is a little more complicated than that because you do have to, to be a match, be, have a blood type that's compatible with your donor. Um, and then, if your blood types are compatible, it's possible that you who wants a transplant has antibodies in your blood against human genes, against another person's genes. So why would that be? Well, if you've ever been exposed to another person's genes, for example, you had a blood transfusion, well, that blood wasn't yours. And so your body recognized that that blood wasn't yours and it made antibodies against the genes of the donors in that blood. If you've had a previous kidney transplant, that kidney's not yours. And so the body forms antibodies against everything foreign in it. The body's made to do that, to keep us healthy against infections. Unfortunately, messes up matching and transplant. So when folks have a lot of antibodies in their blood against human genes, it becomes hard to find a match because every donor, they got antibodies against. And we can't be doing transplants into folks if they have antibodies against the donor because those antibodies immediately attack and destroy the kidney and it don't work. That field has been revolutionized over the last 10 to 15 years with technology that today tells us exactly what these antibodies are and we can put those antibodies into a computer system so that we can, when we look at the potential donors, we know what genes they have and the computer can try to match up recipients because we know what antibodies they have with donors because we know what genes they have and try to find suitable donor kidney genes to match the antibodies that the recipient has. That's the way that technology works. If folks have a living donor that's not a match, about 20 years ago they were out of luck. The best way to get folks transplanted with high antibodies is if you've got a living donor. And if they're not a match, we can put you into a computer system and try to find a situation where maybe somebody else's healthy donor can match you. Maybe somebody else's healthy donor has the genes that you need to match you. And in exchange, on the same day, your healthy donor that didn't match you matches somebody else. This was just an idea in the United States in 2000, 17 years ago. The first one of those exchange transplants was done in the United States, in Boston, in 2000. We started that kind of an exchange program here in 2008. We did our first set of exchange transplants in 2008 between a couple that lives in uh, uh, Rockport uh, and a couple that lives in Temple, Texas. A husband and a wife, they were each husband and wife pairs and they didn't match each other, but we exchanged them back in 2008. And since 2008, we've done more incompatible exchange transplants at this hospital than any hospital in the world. Than any hospital in the world. So if you've got lots of antibodies, the best thing to be able to do is see if you can find a donor, even if they're not a match. If you go through all these strategies and you're on the list and you're not able to get transplanted with a living donor, because it's more difficult for folks to get transplanted with lots of antibodies in their blood, the transplant community gives extra priority to people that have lots of antibodies so it makes it easier for them to get matched. And so built into the system that matches deceased donor kidneys, folks that have lots of antibodies in their blood get priority. Does it answer your question? I was hoping you could fix the PRA. So that's a separate question. So the separate question is, is there a way to permanently remove antibodies? And the answer to that unfortunately is no. There are ways to temporarily lower antibodies to be able to get a close match into you that with extra immune suppression can often work well. But today, there isn't any approved medicine or technique or therapy
to permanently eliminate those antibodies. But this is also the, the, the good thing about the living uh, donor program and the exchange, because uh, like Dr. Bingerman said, if you have a living donor, we can look for somebody in exchange who would be very close to your tissue type. And we do, uh, in order to uh, allow this to happen, we do the desensitization procedures uh, prior to transplant. And we have done also a fair number of, of those. We use uh, um, plasmapheresis and, and other uh, medication infusions to allow the transplant to happen. So in fact, we did, uh, we have transplanted a lot of people with 100% PRA that way. Okay, so don't give up your hope. Who's next? <clears throat> yes, sir. Yes, my question is, what is the percentage of rejections after y'all do all of the, the testing and everything, and let's say you do the transplant, what is the percentage of those the transplants rejecting the transplant? Right. No, so what, what is the danger of rejection and what's the percentage? Actually, at our center, uh, the rejection rate is uh, somewhere around 5% or less. <coughs> Now sometimes, and this is also one of the myths, and because uh, people say, well, what happens if I reject the kidney? Now the, reje the process of rejection doesn't mean you will lose the kidney, okay? So there are two different stories. And this is why people uh, after transplant are followed very closely, because the, the highest chances of rejection happen during the first few months to a year after a transplant. Okay, this is why we check the blood, uh, check the, the numbers, and this is very important for the recipients to always know what the kidney numbers are uh, so we can catch it if it happens early. The, the major reason for, for rejection is usually when people don't take their medicines. So what, what is the telltale signs of rejection? <coughs> so there are really sometimes during, so what are the signs of rejection? There is also a little bit of a myth in it, because sometimes in, in some of the education materials in, in various centers, people say, oh, you will have fevers and pain over the kidney and so on, and you start feeling well, uh, bad. And, and that's, that's when the kidney already is too far gone. So there are really, I tell my patients, there are really no signs of rejection unless you know where your creatinine stands, what your kidney function is. And this is why follow up with the labs and <coughs> taking your medicines after transplant it's very, very important. This is also something very important to stress, especially in the area of living kidney donation, because we do see occasional patients who, are, who have no problems taking a kidney from somebody and then they do not take care of it. Yeah. Okay, we have seen it a lot of times. <coughs> now, the, there was a big study done why kidney transplant, uh, uh, kidney, uh, transplant the kidneys fail, and over 50% of all failure of the kidney, transplanted kidney is due to non-compliance. The patients don't take their medicines right, they do not come for their appointments, and they fail to manage the kidney. Now, it, it, this is also one, one of the myths. Also, people are very healthy and can lead pretty much normal lives. Women can get pregnant when they receive a transplant, and so on and so on. We have had basketball players who, who received the kidney <coughs> transplant, and they still played for the NBA for a couple of years. So, so the options are you know, pretty much like a healthy person, but it's like you, you have a leased vehicle, you don't own it, okay? So a repo man can come if you don't take care of it. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take one more question and then we're gonna take a three minute break, which is becoming shorter, uh, and then we're gonna re, uh, regather. So we're gonna take one more question and then we're gonna move on, yes sir. We're global society now. If I travel around the world and find somebody in the UK, Italy, yeah. China, yeah. you're saying you'll mail tubes to them. How yeah. does that work? Yeah, out yeah. that's a good question. So the question is, if I have a potential kidney donor that lives far away, how does that work? Good question. Uh, I can answer that, or Dr. K, do you want to handle that? So donors can be from anywhere, of course, right? So in other words, we recognize that if you live in Washington State and we're in San Antonio, we can help to make that happen, right? Uh, so in the United States, it's of course easier, right? So, so if you live anywhere in the United States, and that includes Alaska and Hawaii, right? So, so we can get a lot of this evaluation done at home. 
We do feel it's important for potential donors to come to San Antonio at least for one day prior to being approved so that they can meet our team and we can meet them. Right? So, so the donor has to have the capacity to, to come here, typically for one day. Now, the other important capacity is that we can't be just in the business of allowing folks to donate a kidney and then wondering whatever happened to them. So we have to be able to follow up with potential donors. That means donors that come to us that want to donate a kidney and are approved have to agree to be able to, at a minimum, follow up with us for two years post-donation. That means they need to answer questions about their health and submit the answers to those questions and get blood and urine testing done so that we know that they remain healthy after donation. That's a federal guideline now, okay? So that means that if you are donating a kidney from, let's say, outside the country, which you can do, you'd have to come here and then you'd have to pledge to be able to follow up for at least two years, but ideally for longer. So that's, those are the essentially guidelines and mandates for kidney donation. So can you donate if you live far away from San Antonio? Yes. However, you need to come here at least once before being approved and you need to be able to pledge to follow up with us after donation. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little surface. It sort of ties between between the travel uh, time and certain uh, things and the payment for transplantation. Okay, because uh, although you cannot reimburse somebody for just giving uh, a kidney, so you cannot pay somebody two thousand bucks and expect the organ, <clears throat> but you can, and this is allowed, and this is ethically uh, justifiable to pay the travel expenses. Yeah. So this is allowable. So I don't want to make the, the impression that no, no payment is, you know, because you, you, cannot, you cannot pay folks to do this, but they cannot uh, be expected to pay in order to donate to you, right? And uh, I give you a situation here. Also, this is sort of the ethical dilemma sometimes because we have a lot of immigrants, let's say, coming from uh, to give you an example uh, from Philippines, I had a guy at, when, when I was still at, at UAB uh, who, uh, who uh, paid a, a bunch of money to his niece to come over. They came from extremely poor family and they were under such pressure and the, the payment induced sort of a, a consent that was not valid. So we cannot be even uh, have an appearance of impropriety with a healthy, you know, rich society gets a transplant by exploiting somebody who lives in a, in a poor country. So one has to be very, very cautious of that. But to give you an example, we had a guy who came all the way from Spain, or was it from Italy, to, to donate to his, to his brother. Okay, so those things are possible, but they have to be evaluated on an individual basis.